the battle for the mind of North America will be fought in the video arena. The Videodrome. The television screen is the retina of the mind's eye. Therefore, the television screen is part of the physical structure of the brain. Therefore, whatever happens on the television screen emerges as raw experience for those who watch it. Television is reality, and reality is less than television. After all, there is nothing real outside our perception of reality. Is there? <laughs> Join me as we continue our journey through the mind and body, and we discuss David Cronenberg's Videodrome. Long live the new flesh. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of our journey through the mind and body in horror cinema, and this is where they converge. This is part 10, in which we are going to be discussing David Cronenberg's incredible, dizzying, mind-bending masterpiece, Videodrome. This will be a spoilerific review. If you haven't seen Videodrome, go and give it a watch, then listen to our discussion. We've got so much to cover, so let's get straight into it. I'm very excited to introduce a brand new guest to the podcast. He's a huge Cronenberg fan, but he's also a writer, critic, journalist, and he is the author of a beautiful brand new book, an in-depth guide to the scariest films ever made called The Book of Horror. It is my great pleasure to welcome to the podcast Matt Glasby. Hello. 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 How are you? Good. Really Good. excited to be here. Very excited to have you here. How? Uh, first of all, how's uh, how's lockdown life for you? Um, yeah, it's a little bit up and down. Uh, sometimes really busy, sometimes nothing doing. So this is a nice distraction. Uh, nice to be uh, boning up on my Cronenberg, so to speak. <laughs> nice. Nice. I like that. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself, first of all, just sort of who you are, what you do. So I'm a film critic. I write for Total Film and GQ and other magazines like that. I'm also the author of three books on film. And the latest, which is coming out in September, is called The Book of Horror. Oh, my God. So I have been privileged enough to have a little look through this, and it looks absolutely incredible. Uh, tell us a bit about it. What what, what what kind of inspired you to write this book, first of all, and what is the book? Well, I've been a massive, massive horror fan since I was about, I don't know, maybe nine or ten, like mm-hmm. f- far too far too young to see some of these things. <laughs> and uh, I've always wanted to write something like this. Um, the book is about um, most compendiums of horror, most things that go deep into horror, like this podcast, look at the history of horror. Mm. And actually, it occurred to me that the thing that most horror fans care about is, is something scary. Mm -hmm. So the book is a guide, obviously my subjective opinion, but a guide to the scariest films ever made with really beautiful black and white illustrations by Barney Bodoano. Oh, beautiful. And the the illustrations are absolutely stunning as well. Uh, He's done an amazing job. You both have. Uh, I don't want to spoil too much of the book, but what films are included in this book? What what are some of what are some of the films that you can you tell me what are some of the films that you consider to be some of the scariest ever made? Well, obviously that's one of those it's a tricky question. And I spent mm. about six six months trying to get to the bottom of it. Some of them are obvious. You probably can't write this book and miss out, say, The Exorcist. But it, t- it occurred to me that there's lots of things we consider as as canon, but you can miss out, like watch back the omen and you might not find that it's that scary anymore. Whereas there's so much stuff in the, you know, the back of Shudder or Netflix or wherever that you've never heard of um, that's actually terrifying. I found mm-hmm. so much amazing stuff um, because I didn't just want to write the book of films I already knew. Obviously, I'm a fan. You spend your whole time looking for the next hit. So I wanted to, to find things as long as people can get them somewhere that's not YouTube, um, somewhere legally, that like take things right to the edges and the only proviso was it has to be scary it doesn't have to be good it doesn't have to be politically correct it doesn't have to be any of this stuff it just has to work Mm, that is really interesting and it's true like it's something that i always ask all my new guests on the podcast it's something i will ask you eventually as well you know it's it's almost two separate questions in terms of what 
what's your favorite horror film but also what's your scariest horror film because they like you said they're not always the same thing a lot of people might say the omen is their favorite but not necessarily their scariest and then there are some films that for whatever reason do terrify you even if they even if they're actually not if they're a bit naff or whatever like i always find the original pet cemetery from the 80s (laughs) maybe it's maybe it's growing up watching it but i think that film is still genuinely quite terrifying even though it's pretty naff like those moments with zelda and 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 you know and i wouldn't necessarily consider it the greatest horror film ever made but it scares the shit out of me so i guess they are different you have just dated your your age to like the <laughs> month of your age growing up. It's really scary. It is. It's it's <laughs> Zelda coming towards the camera. That's what it is. Absolutely horrific. But like uh, I said, you know that moment is is not okay, really, is it? Yeah. Um, but it is scary. So you know this. Yeah, trying to include things on their scare merits rather than any other kind of merit. Yeah. And then actually, when you boil things down to that, um, that's that's what we're all here for. I would say. Mm, you know, yeah. I love I love found footage, and some of the things that have scared me in found footage are truly terrible movies, but they're scary, you know. And tell us a little bit about how you kind of classified scariness, because you've kind of broken it down, haven't you, into really interesting categories the the different ways in which horror films can scare you, right? Yeah, we wanted to make uh, to give the reader sort of something that they hadn't had before. So what we do is uh, the book breaks down how each film scares us into seven different categories, seven different mm-hmm. types of scare. You know, one mm-hmm. of them's the uncanny, another one is the unexpected. Yeah. Uh, the idea being that uh, almost like a kind of graphic equaliser that certain films, you know, are full of jump scares, which would be the unexpected. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other films, just as scary, but operate on a su- subtle level and have a kind of subliminal scares. You know, that there's different kind of scares. And actually, um, most turns out most movies use most of these seven different ways of scaring you they've just got different dials turned up and down it's really interesting um Um, and actually something that we're looking at quite a lot on this particular series of the podcast are films that may not may not be considered necessarily classic horror in the traditional sense like the films of david lynch and david cronenberg yet they do contain some of the scariest moments in cinema some of these films right um which i find really interesting that kind of sort of margin yeah i mean i suppose what i've done is is i've set myself up to 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 have thrown stones thrown at me um because (laughs) you have to set the margins of what you consider the genre to be yeah and and then you know then you have to sort of zero in from then so i've said in the introduction there's no david cronenberg films in this book Uh i love david cronenberg i love him but none of his films are in these top 100 so scary films there's no david lynch in there i love david lynch I don't count him as ho- as horror movies. They're weirder than that. There's no Brian De Palma. You know, there's no, some of these massive names that in a, a horror history would absolutely deserve their own chapters in this like, you know, purely qualitative, does it scare you? Don't get a look in. And lots of the tiny little names or people that would, would have been uh, forgotten but in a horror history, the footnotes, if you like, yes. uh, get entire chapters to themselves yeah so yes yeah, just a, a completely hopefully a different way of looking at it which starts some conversations and you know which gets people reading about films that they already love and hearing some films they haven't heard of before yeah definitely definitely well that sounds wonderful when uh, can we expect the book when will it be out the book is out on the 22nd of september just in time for halloween love it um, yeah Love it. Amazing. So speaking of David Cronenberg, then uh, we're going to get into our discussion uh, about Videodrome shortly. Let me first of all, just ask you, uh, let me ask you a bit about this sort of subgenre um, of horror, body horror, of which David Cronenberg is, he's the man, isn't he? He's kind of the pioneer, really, it feels like of this subgenre, particularly in his early career. Um, are you a fan of body horror? What do you think of it? I'm a huge David Cronenberg fan. And as you said, it's almost that he is the genre. Yes. And if you try and think of other films, body horror films that aren't David Cronenberg's, I would argue that lots of them, ironically, aren't horror. So you get a lot of body horror films that are sci-fi. And then a lot of the sort of splatter, splattier stuff, you know, it is body horror, but it's also veering towards comedy. You know, horror comedy, you know, Brain Dead, um, Evil Dead 2, that sort of thing. So actually to find a body horror film that is a horror film is harder than you would think as i'm sure you've been finding out well it yes except that i do think a lot of body horror 
I personally find body horror really, really horrible. <laughs> like, really, uh, not. I mean, obviously, not the stuff like Peter Jackson's movies, but but particularly some of this early Cronenberg stuff. It's. I don't know what it is. It's the squishiness of it. It's the tactility of it. It's the. It's the. You know, um, fingernails coming off in the fly and pulling teeth out and that sort of stuff. I find really repulsive in a cl- classic kind of traditional horror sense. You know. And does that repulsion sort of equate to fear for you? Because it doesn't for me, but I could totally see how it would for someone else. Uh, Yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I don't know whether... I guess I'm using fear as a very, very broad umbrella with with which all of these other things come under. But I guess repulsion is, for me, kind of part of that in a way. No, absolutely. And one of the the categories that I looked at the horror films in in the book is the grotesque. Yes. When we see wounds, when we see insects, when we yeah. see things that aren't quite right to do with the body, mm-hmm. we have a strong reaction. The reason why people fainted in The Exorcist wasn't to do with the devil. It was to do with blood and puke and yeah. you know broken bodies. So I think pe- that does scare people. I'm just saying for me personally, that's not a biggie. Mm-hmm. But yeah, with um, Cronenberg particularly, uh, that's absolutely huge. And um, you're seeing bodies doing things that they're not meant to do. And you do have a reaction. I guess mine is fascination, not fear. And you can really into that what you will yes yeah you're so right <laughs> uh so david cronenberg you said you're a fan of cronenberg do you remember sort of your entry into cronenberg what your first sort of experience of his films was <laughs> yeah we had um i got given or got hold of a vhs of scanners um, oh <laughs> amazing so, so i watched it and i loved it like you know the exploding heads like i must have been nine or ten what more do you want from life <laughs> um, and the back the back of the vhs you know described the setup for scanners and uh spoilers for scanners are coming up uh, people <laughs> it took us from the beginning of the film right up until daryl revok and cameron vale face off and then it says you know the you know the game is set for uh, the ultimate showdown oh but once, wow. but once you've seen the film that's like minute 85 of yeah. 87 yeah <laughs> so it was just it completely spoiled its own video that's hilarious <laughs> i guess in a way that i mean that film is absolutely bonkers i, I literally rewatched it this week because i've just chatted about it on the podcast and it is so weird the acting is really weird and kind of wooden and stilted the whole story is quite strange and that ending it is like i i, I kind of forgot how strange some of these early cronenberg movies are you know what he was what was happening with scanners is that on one hand it's it's really strange you're right the acting is weird and wooden yeah. there's all these mad concepts and actually really out there gore and on the yeah. other hand it's delivered a straight ahead kind of sci-fi thriller yeah actually if you watched post pub in 1981 or whenever it came out you'd yeah. be really happy so he's managed to do that thing of writing a really great exploitation film that is also all this other cool weird stuff like he smuggled that in and yeah it really stands up I remember it being a tiny bit sort of wooden and awkward a few years ago and watched it for for this video drone chat. Mm. And um yeah, I thought it actually it was really polished, really professional, so much better than I remember. And I love it, but um yeah, yeah. that is really interesting. And I you're right, you know, he 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 kind of rides that line, doesn't he, between exploitation and and almost art house, uh, and particularly this kind of point in his career, this early yeah. 80s, because I think the further we go into the 90s where we go beyond things like Crash and then into some of his sort of 21st century stuff, it is more on the kind of more, um, whatever you want to call it, prestigious, highbrow, artistic cinema and less of the exploitation. But this point in the 80s is a really interesting balance, isn't it, that he strikes? Yeah, he's just coming into his own at this point. I think some of the earlier Cronenbergs, like, I love them, but I think there's there, some of the aspects are lacking, some of the directions lacking, some of the acting, especially in Shivers, is pretty bad. And then, <laughs> Oh, it's not worse than Scanners. I'm sorry, Scanners is absolutely atrocious. I think it's only it's only Stephen Lack, Cameron Vale in Scanners, <laughs> who's got this amazing greeny blue eyes, but it's very wooden. And everyone yeah. else is brilliant, I think. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, Quentin was moving from out and out exploitation with a few ideas into this kind of, he's basically hitting his stride about Scanners Videodrome, I would say. And so the films are 
really entertaining, really pacey, amazing ideas. And they've still got that kind of exploitation that like you could watch them with your brain turned off and still like, have a pretty good time. So like, this is absolute gold for the horror fan, this uh, this area. Yeah, yeah, you're so right. And it does, that that sensibility kind of peaks there, doesn't it, with Videodrome? It feels like it's a kind of perfect combination, I think, of all of those elements that we've just discussed that kind of makes Cronenberg, I think. Yeah, because a lot later on as well, the films may be brilliant, but they're not very much fun once you get into the 90s, right? Yes. So, you yeah. know, stuff like Naked Lunch and Crash, they, they've all got all the ideas, but the ent- entertainment value has dipped somewhat yeah the, the the they're more they're certainly so much more challenging aren't they um it's kind of like when you get into the inland empires of <laughs> of lynch's career isn't it it's like the it's it goes a little bit over the line in terms of that sort of slightly weird but still entertaining kind of balance i mean i don't think anything goes as far as inland empire but <laughs> Jesus. it just didn't need to be three hours did it inland empire i mean i, I probably could have enjoyed it had it been 90 minutes but not three hours no no no. (laughs) um okay let's get into it then we've got lots to discuss let's kick off our discussion of david cronenberg's videodrome from 1983 why would anybody watch a scum show like videodrome why did you watch it max business reasons sure what about the other reasons Max Wren is a victim. I woke up with a headache. He What's has that? been exposed to Videodrome. I've been hallucinating for a while, ever since... What? Since I first saw Videodrome. His brain is already receiving video images. I think that massive doses of Videodrome signal will ultimately produce and control hallucination to the point that it will change human reality. Soon, his visions will coalesce and become uncontrollable flesh. Videodrome is seducing Max Wren. Videodrome. Videodrome, starring Deborah Harry and James Woods. A shocking new vision from the creator of Scanners. Coming soon to a theater near you from Universal Pictures. So, Videodrome is about a character called Max Wren, played by James Woods, who runs a cable, a sort of CD cable TV station in Toronto. And he's always looking for the next big thing. He's he's trying to find the thing that breaks through in terms of pornography or violence. And uh, he happens across a signal for a show called Videodrome, which is effectively just what we'd recognise as a torture porn setup. People are tied to walls and whipped and electrocuted. And whereas most people would, would turn off from this, he says, this is amazing. Like, I've got to get this. And slowly he finds that there's more to Videodrome than meets his mind's eye. Mm, quite yeah Mm. um so tell me first of all i mean we've kind of touched upon this already but what do you think of videodrome uh are you a fan i absolutely love it and um this is one of those films that i wonder how i would i would feel if i saw it now Um, i'm a grown-up i'm a film critic and you see things differently i saw that as a 12 or 13 year old i bought it on vhs and it had it didn't really have a proper release in this country back in the day Mm -hmm. so before dvds it was really hard to get hold of and i got hold of a copy at my local record shop and i went home and stuck it on and it had a time code oh my god and get this every scene that wasn't just straight blood so like a shooting say or straight sex was um i mean you know what i mean uh yeah was, was trimmed so every time there was like an amazing gore effect this one part of character explodes in kind of tumors yes that was cut. So this film that's quite confusing and quite gory and say, you know, 90 minutes long was like 79 minutes. And I had not got a clue what was happening. <laughs> it made, it, it made, imagine that film making less sense than it does. Oh my God. But I and loved re- it. You still loved it? Yeah, because again, I was like 12, 13, all these images, the imagery is so powerful. And also it's not a film where you exactly need to know exactly where you are at all points. Mm. Um, so yeah, it really spoke to me. And then years later, the DVD came out and I was like, oh shit, <laughs> that's what I was missing. That's amazing. I love it. That 
I can't even imagine what that must be like if they cut any moments of gore or, you know, that's kind of all the interesting stuff in a way from Corona. Like they're the images you remember from Video right. Drone. And also they didn't cut it well. This was like, you know, some, <laughs> some, t- like some TV broadcast copy that somehow would find its way to Exeter Martian <laughs> Records or whatever. And so like it was just truly terrible. The colours were awful. It was a bad pan and scan video anyway. And then, yeah, so rediscovering the film as a grown-up has, has like, given me a completely different film. But also, like, what? An, how appropriate a way to watch a Videodrome than on a weird pirated video? Yeah, it's kind of perfect, isn't it? That, that, yeah. that is, that's really, that's so true. Um, I absolutely love it as well. I, I, funnily enough, I didn't have that good an, an experience with it the first time I saw it. I think I first saw it when I was about 16 and I was, I think, just so baffled by it and it just maybe wasn't what I was expecting because I had heard that this was the movie that had lots of like quite crazy out there gore and practical effects and stuff and actually it, there's so much more to it as well isn't there um and i was just i think it just went a bit over my head particularly in the sort of second half of the film <laughs> i just didn't know what i was watching but every time i watch it i kind of fall in love with it a little bit more and and actually re-watching it this week i was like wow this is i think it is my probably i, I i've always said that the fly is my favorite cronenberg film but this might this might almost take it i think just because it's so interesting and it it i love that i'm sort of always left thinking about it and not knowing quite what i've just watched by the end of it you know yeah it doesn't quite land on a final reading does it whereas no. the, the fly is like it is the hollywood version of cronenberg it's an amazing film it might be my favorite i'm not sure it's hard it's to kind pick. of perfect isn't it yeah it, it, it's almost a better film but yeah. but yeah videodrome is those loose ends are so fascinating and i think you could just go round and round and round following them and just lose your mind like the only thing i know for sure when i'm watching it is that david cronenberg knows what's going on <laughs> yes i don't think there's another person on the planet that can tell you exactly what's going on in that film it's fascinating isn't it and let's let me ask you let me start off by asking you about you know like what you mentioned you know in some ways the ideal way to have first watched it is on a dodgy videotape i mean when you've got a film that is so much about video cassettes and this kind of stuff uh how relevant, how does this film still work today in 2020, do you think? Do you think it still holds up? That's, I mean, that's that's a really interesting question. I think, firstly, I don't know how people feel about videos. I don't know how people feel about physical media. I'm yeah. just old enough that I think I've still got like a couple of videos or just got rid of them recently, mm-hmm. even though I yeah. can't play them. I understand for other people that would be, you know... Um, that's a matter for ancient history. So I don't know about that aspect. One of the things that I always think of um, with that title is that they always talk about remaking it. But when you yeah. remake something, you want to keep the name. <laughs> but if you keep yes. Videodrome, no one's going to have a fucking clue what you're talking no, about. No, no. Video now is is what you get on YouTube, isn't it? That's the thing. And there, there, there is a difference. And I think this is so much about the time because it's not just about VHS, but it's also about that early 80s boom of VHS when things were getting kind of sold, you know, op- kind of non-mainstream stuff was getting sold and distributed to you know to anybody's homes it was it almost you know feels like it ties in with that video nasty thing of the uk of like people not knowing what they were getting and what they were going to watch and this idea of dangerous films that you could access on video right which again kind of doesn't really exist anymore unless you think of the unless you count the internet but it doesn't really exist in that way no absolutely when i was trying to find stuff for the book of horror almost everything that's ever been made you can find somewhere, even if it's, yes. you know, you, you can find it somewhere. Whereas the era that I watched Videodrome in, like I said, you know, you bought terrible VHS cassettes from secondhand shops. And yeah. the era that Cronenberg made it in, actually it's a few years ahead of its time. He was looking ahead because yeah. it is, it does sort of rattle with these fears of having powerful films in the hands of normal people. And actually, obviously that's what the video nasty thing was entirely about. Yes. So Cronenberg, and then Cronenberg, I think this just came out so this is 83 and the video nasties was 85 so Cronenberg was seeing that stuff in the wind mm-hmm. uh, way ahead of its time as is often the case with him yeah exactly and I think you know despite all of the analog media and everything <laughs> um, you know despite how much it's so much about the early 80s there it is also it feels super relevant to right now right I mean I think you know that comment on sort of screen culture on our obsession with screens over real life i mean that's something that is probably even more important now than it ever was uh this idea of us kind of living and breathing 
in media, really, and continuing to exist beyond flesh. These are genuinely kind of realistic issues and ideas that are going on in the world right now that were explored 30 years ago in Videodrome. And also the comment on television as well, you know, like that that idea that Max sees this TV show which is just non-stop torture of contributors with no real story. Uh, I feel like that is also, you know, it could be an almost satire on modern television and reality TV, this idea of we're just watching people suffer for entertainment and that's, you know, and th- there's a there's a line when Max actually says, you know, this is the future of television. And I suppose he was kind of right there, you know? So, and and of course, there is also a whole load of commentary about the dangers of horror cinema and violence on screen and how that could affect people. That's a conversation that's gone on for absolutely decades and it's still happening right now, isn't it? Especially with, you know, stuff that you can access on the internet, which may be genuinely harmful. Absolutely. I mean, he was in Cronenberg originally wrote it as a thriller called Network of Blood. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> how good is that title? And um, But the idea being, as a boy, he just tuned into late night telly and um when the canadian channel shut off channels from new york came through and he'd get stuff coming through in his telly he had no idea what and mm. actually you know so that would have inspired him i'm guessing like the late 70s early 80s but what we're talking about now is the internet as representing a similar kind of thing you know you don't know what you're going to get you don't know what five second video you can look at next and it's all out there and clearly some of it I mean, the censorship argument is, is a little bit further down the line maybe but it's not all good for you it's not all good stuff and it's not all safe um you know we have images of people being beheaded we have things that you really uh shouldn't see and perhaps shouldn't have access to um and that conversation is going to be running and running and running even at the point in which things are beamed directly into our brains which happens in the movie i guess doesn't it yeah and it's certainly and it's something i'm going to be talking about later on in this particular series as well is um although it's not traditional body horror this idea of extreme cinema i suppose Mm -hmm. and films that do have that reputation whether it's cannibal holocaust or a serbian film or you know sallow all those types of films that have those reputations as to is it is it you know is any of it real is any of this violence is it snuff is it horror you know where does the where does the kind of where's the line and again i feel like that was part of the 70s and 80s as well because so many of these films were so grainy and so yeah. grim and you didn't quite know sometimes when watching something like last house on the left or whatever you know what am i seeing here what's real and what isn't how do we know to trust these filmmakers that we've never heard of and that kind of thing you know yeah and as a fan uh, you tend to watch watch everything and then sort of decide what's too much for you <laughs> like yeah you can't do it the right way around so I mean, <laughs> yeah. there's definitely some things that i wouldn't want to watch again i'm not a big fan of the kind of last house on the left sort yeah. of style of film but yeah you've got to go there to know <laughs> to know that you don't want to see it yeah um, it's and, tricky. and there's that there is that element too that videodrome i think handles really well this idea that you know these characters even though it's so wrong this thing this broadcast that they're picking up they're kind of curious to watch it and he knows that his viewers might be curious to watch it as well and i think we've all had that especially as horror fans you know when you hear about these films with these reputations as much as i might often regret them after i've seen them i kind of do want to see them right i mean did you did you go through a phase as a horror fan of kind of wanting to seek out these films that are really notorious or whatever yeah it wasn't so much a phase it was uh you know, yeah, you you try and see everything. And then like I say, you sort of pull back from that. Um, Yeah. And as well, there are some real works of art amongst the, like the acres and acres of trash. I'd say Cannibal Holocaust is a a shitload better than a lot of the similar films because it knows what it's doing and so comments on it. Yes. Um, Some of them obviously are absolute, absolute out there trash. I've got Mm -hmm. a bit of a soft spot for a Serbian film. I I probably shouldn't (laughs) say that, but... (laughs) Um, also sometimes you watch these things and they're incredibly disappointing and you wonder what the fuss is about yeah Um, that's so true it's so true of so many of the video nasties of course because that kind of moral panic got so extreme that they were banning anything that wasn't remotely you know disturbing or shocking or controversial in any way they just might have had a title that sounded a bit provocative you know um but cannibal holocaust was probably still deserving of that reputation in a way so 
Let's talk about James Woods then. I mean, ca- you know, carrying this film in a way from beginning to end as the sort of sole protagonist. What do you think of James Woods? And what do you think of this character of Max as well? Kind of scuzzy, sleazy guy, right? Well, I'm not going to comment on James Woods, the man. Uh, James Woods, the actor, is, <laughs> yeah. uh, is he's very, very good in this. Um, and Cronenberg said he called him his cinematic equal. I think it was the first time he'd got a leading man that was sort of was up to his standard, basically. Yeah. We, we talked about the problem with Scanners. And um, so finally, it's got James Woods, who truly, really brings it to this part. And uh, I think he's excellent in the part. I think the other thing is, is that we're the, the Hollywood version of this story has a sort of a character with softer edges, has like a redeemable guy. But Max Wren is a scumbag. And yes. there's no, not only like... He's just filthy. He's he's not a good person. And so watching this play out to him removes that element of morality and actually makes things quite a lot more interesting. Yeah, I, that was going to be my next question was, do you, do you like him as a person in this film, Max? No, and I don't, I don't mind not liking a character. They just need to be compelling. And he is really compelling. Um, he does lots of, he just small scale awful things. I didn't notice until the until I was watching it just this time that he's passing, he's going through his work corridor and he just slaps a secretary on the bum and you're like that's that's terrible behavior and obviously just terrible and i hadn't noticed that before but that's so that's our leading man this is the guy we're rooting for is someone that's routinely you know assault a secretary who works yeah. for him and it's a um, really clever thing i think cronenberg is quite clever how he handles that kind of stuff and some of it like you say is quite subtle some of those character moments because the film is you could look at it on the surface as being quite a sleazy film too, I think. You know, his relationship with Deborah Harry's character and kind of some of those scenes together. Again, I think from a kind of very superficial level, a lot of people might look at this film and think it is the thing it's commenting on, I suppose, which is kind of sleazy trash. Can you get it any clearer? It's a pirate tape, this scrambler. I like it. Yeah. Yeah, it turns me on. Take out your Swiss army knife and cut me here just just a little. I'll say somebody's beat me to it. See, those scenes are so cold for me. And yeah. so there's such a distance. And they're in like in no way are, are they erotic. I'm not sure if they're even mm-hmm. meant to be. That that mm-hmm. never popped up for me. Like there's something really far away. Uh Debbie Harry plays Nikki Brand who becomes uh Max Wren's girlfriend and is into S and M, and there's something so distant and hard to read about her performance that nothing, none of the things they do feel like hot or sexy or anything like that. They feel like it's like we're watching weird aliens or insects doing something strange. Yes, and actually, that's so funny you said that because that's exactly we had this conversation about um, on the podcast about the Brood and Scanners together about how. For me, sometimes the problem with Cronenberg is that it can be quite cold. Sometimes he takes such a kind of scientific or clinical look at what's happening on screen that I kind of want it to draw me in a bit more emotionally, you know? I want it to impact me more. Um, Do you think that's a problem for you, at least in Videodrome, that kind of coldness? No, I think what happens is is that um, like James Woods brings a kind of reptilian charm to the Mm. film, which is actually kind of, if we're talking about coldness that brings some heat to it. He's not yeah. a very nice person, but he is a real person with like real kind of like a sort of like animal drives. And then Cronenberg's eye and brain is so sort of cold that those provide a really good contrast. I also think, I also think that the actor who plays Harlan, who's finding the video drone signal for Max Wren, but it's also his kind of his best friend, that Peter Tavorsky brings a lovely kind of goofy, like almost like Coen Brothers kind of warmth to that part, which is really strange yeah. and almost... It's almost, he just plays it for it. The part as written is nothing, and the actor really brings something to that, which again just brings a little bit of heat to it. So I feel this is like one of of the early and mid Cronenberg films. I feel like this is the one where, where coldness isn't a problem. I agree with you 100%. I think what I love so much about this film, maybe compared to some of his earlier stuff, is that it it's just a bit more absorbing. You know, I feel like I'm a little bit more drawn in to these characters. I guess it's deliberately a bit more subjective, right? We are essentially seeing the world 
as Max is seeing it, whether or not that's a hallucination or whether or not that's real. So there is much more of a kind of subjective eye maybe than some of his earlier films where you feel like you're just like looking at wide shots of hospitals and clinics and and surgeries and that kind of thing, you know? Yeah, absolutely. We're drawn into Max's hallucinations even before we realise that we are. So it slips from a sort of third person, you know, being at Max's shoulder to actually being, it's not so obvious as a first person point of view shot, but to actually seeing things maybe things that aren't there, but seeing things the way he sees things. And I think Cronenberg's onto something here. There's always this idea that to share a character's viewpoint in a film, they need to be nice, you know, the save the cat thing. They need to have yeah. two or four kids and we need to root for them because they're saving up for their, you know, mum's operation. But actually that's not true. Like he's there, he seems real, he's convincing and he's compelling. So to see the world from his jaundice point of view is is part of what going to the movies is about is seeing other viewpoints. Professor Oblivion. What do you think? Do you think erotic TV shows and violent TV shows lead to desensitization, to dehumanization? Is the microphone... The television screen has become the retina of the mind's eye. (laughs) Yes. That's why I refuse to appear on television, except on television what do you make of the character of uh brian oblivion uh you know fascinating this guy that only exists on screen right you know there's that the first time we see him is when they're on that talk show and he is just like a television screen (laughs) that's propped up on this set and then he spouts all this weird stuff about the screen is the mind the retina of the mind's eye and all of this stuff you know um what do you think of him and the sort of purpose that he serves in this film well firstly uh, with without any sort of critical faculties i just love that guy like yeah it's such he's a ama- his voice is amazing he's a great performance um, yeah and also he's got some really funny lines um he appears on a chat show and he's on it he's appearing on a television on tv yeah and he says oh i never appear on tv unless i'm on tv and in yes. this really serious <laughs> film like things like that sort of have a kind of goofy quality that i really like also it may not be entirely apparent what he's talking about but the way he says it like he says uh the battle for the mind of North America will be fought in the video arena, the video drome. And that, and that, those quotes like that, you can hear on loads of like mid nineties dance tracks. Cause it just, it just sounds like some mental guy bringing you into his realm. And I just, I just love it. I love it. And so, you know, there's these moments and lines <laughs> that stick in my head when he laughs as well with that moment when he goes, well, after all, there's nothing real outside our perception of reality. And then he kind of goes, <laughs> and it's his like deep laugh as well. Uh, he's amazing. I kind of almost every time I watch the film, want to rewind and listen to what he's just said again and kind of make sense of it in my head sometimes, you know, when he goes, well, television is more than reality and reality is less than television and all that stuff, you know. He was based on a, a famous uh, media lecturer called Marshall. McLuhan who lectured at the University of Toronto but Cronenberg wasn't taught by and he pops Mm. up he had lots of theories about uh, how he received media he pops up in Annie Hall there's a Woody Allen joke about him and Marshall McLuhan is really there um, so he's, he was, yeah, he's quite a famous figure of that time. He was obviously um, making a lot of noise, making a lot of sense. So he's based on that. And yeah, uh-huh. it's such a vivid character. It's one of the things I really love about it. Yeah, I love it. I love him. And like you said, these characters that in some ways could be quite minor, could be quite potentially on the off the page, could be a bit cold or a bit wooden are actually brilliant in this film because of the way they're directed, because of these performers. Uh, you know, like you say, the character of Harlan. Yeah. Even his assistant, I kind of... Yeah. She's the character I kind of feel the most for, in a way, you know? <laughs> she's so nice. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> She's so nice. Exactly. She's gotten... Yeah, she gets a really tough deal. Uh. And actually... And, you know, Debbie Harry. What do you make of Debbie Harry and her character? I, I always forget, actually how little she's in it I always think of her in my mind as being a much bigger role because she kind of disappears after the first act and we don't really see her again right I think the character gets quite short shrift I think I don't think it's a great performance or it's suffering from that thing we've talked about before that kind of coldness of some of the Cronenberg characters because she seems very uh, the character's written it seems to be very passionate and very kind of you know she likes being burnt, she likes being cut, she likes all, all this kinky stuff. And actually the character is played, is very cold and far away. And then about a quarter way through the movie, she disappears off pretty much never to be seen again. So it's almost, it sort of feels like the performance wasn't up to it, but almost like it's underwritten, actually. Almost like she's a cipher and she doesn't become more than a cipher, which the some of the other smaller characters 
are played by perhaps it's more confident performances. So they feel warmer and they s- stick in a memory more. Watch it, Alan. I'm shooting. Oh, good Lord. It's... It's unbelievable. It's... It's horrible. I can't understand the reason for such cruelty. It must have something to do with some obscure sexual writer. With the almost profound respect these primitives have for virginity. That was a little clip you heard just there from one of the most disturbing movies ever made. It is, of course, Cannibal Holocaust. A little preview of what's happening over on Patreon this week. This week, we launched for $10 patrons part one of our brand new exclusive mini-series focusing on extreme cinema. This is going to be a little five or six episode journey with me, Brad Hansen, and Zobo with a shotgun in which we discuss in depth some of the most notorious, extreme, depraved, and controversial films ever made. Cannibal Holocaust is, of course, one of them. We're also going to be discussing Gaspar Noe's Irreversible, as well as Sallow, as well as Guinea Pig, as well as a Serbian film. If you think you've got the stomach to listen to us discuss these movies, then please do get involved and sign up to our Patreon. And if you're able to donate a bit of money per month, you will get access to regular bonus content. If you donate $5 per month, you'll get an episode every other week. And actually, right now, we are in the middle of counting down our 50 scariest moments in horror of all time as voted for by patrons. Uh, That countdown is currently available for donors of $5 and upwards. But if you want to donate $10 per month, you'll get a brand new episode every single week, including access to our exclusive mini seasons. And that includes the aforementioned extreme season and a season on Twin Peaks. So access to all of that and a whole back catalogue of other treats. Uh, If you're UK based, you'll also get sent an Evolution of Horror sticker and everybody who signs up also gets a very special shout out on the podcast as a thank you. Speaking of, I'm going to give everybody who's donated to the podcast in the last couple of weeks a very special thank you. So a huge thanks to Paul Decombaz, Nikki Green, Amanda Williams, Dan Gilmore, Julie Brock, Adam Fancy, Eleanor Adams, Kevin Kostelnik, Eric Ward, Alex J. Comerford, and Ray winters a huge thank you to all of those people and one more time if you want to join them if you want to get involved and be treated to regular weekly bonus content sign up now patreon.com slash evolution of horror that's patreon.com slash evolution of horror okay let's return to mine and matt's discussion of the brilliant videodrome max wren your television station offers its viewers everything from softcore pornography to hardcore violence. Why? Well, it's a matter of economics, Rena. We're uh, small. In order to survive, we have to give people something they can't get anywhere else. And, uh, and we do that. But don't you feel such shows contribute to a social climate of violence and sexual malaise? And do you care? Certainly I care. <laughs> I care enough, in fact, to give my viewers uh, a a harmless outlet for their their fantasies and their frustrations. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a socially positive act. What do you think Cronenberg is ultimately saying in this film about about videos about television you know is 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 this in some ways quite a kind of conservative viewpoint of you know films like this are damaging and shouldn't be accessible you know or or is it something more complicated than that <laughs> I mean, it'd be, it'd be really nice to ask David Cronenberg this question because yes. I mean obviously uh, there's a brilliant bit where um Brian Oblivion's daughter says, I am my father's screen. But yeah, I'm not, I can't really speak on behalf of David Cronenberg. I think, but what I think is, he's been really against censorship. He said that censors are like psychotics, that they can confuse reality and illusion. So, and he's complained about having uh, shots cut from most of his earlier films, which they were. And so, what I feel he's doing is he's saying, 
everyone's saying that violent imagery corrupts and sex and violence on TV is bad for you. What if that were actually true? How would that play out? What would that look like? And so for me, it's like he's taking the argument that he doesn't believe in, but taking it to its nth degree. And that's why the film doesn't know where to finish. There is no end to that argument. Both sides of that are presented. That images can be dangerous, that it, that it's that's that saying what we can and can't watch is a method of control by the state. Both of those sides are played, you know, with some degree of force. And then I think the conclusions, I mean the conclusions of what on earth is going on is left up to the viewer yeah you're right and i think i guess that's the thing it's 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 definitely not got that very obvious kind of path or message and i guess the reason why this film still endures so well and people still love it is because of that ambiguity right Um, i I love trying to see something different in this film every time i watch it and trying to figure out exactly what cronenberg is saying with this film you know absolutely we're used to being handed things on a plate Um, And also, Mm. like I said about, you know, having the the protagonist was like a really nice man. It'd be very morally simple as it is. He's a scumbag. Um, Bad things are done to him and he reacts in an incredibly strange way. So none of this is clear cut for you. It's making you work for those answers, which makes it a lot more interesting and actually a lot better conversation starter than a more conservative film. Um, It's worth remembering this came out, this wasn't one of Cronenberg's little Canadian films. This came out through Universal. So God knows what Universal (laughs) thought when they thought, we'll get this guy, he'll make the thriller called Network of Blood, it'll be fine. (laughs) And then then James Woods is in it, Debbie Harry, it'll be amazing. And then on on their desk was the videotape of Videodrome. They were like, what the, is this... What the hell yeah. is this we're watching? Yeah, it's it's just wonderful, isn't it? And I love this. Again, this is not this is not unusual for Cronenberg, but this link that he creates between the technology and the body, I suppose. And what do you make of that strange scene with um, uh, that, you know Brian Oblivion and his daughter running that almost what looks like a kind of makeshift clinic where they've got all of these people in who I don't know if all of them are supposed to be kind of homeless people but they're all coming in and queuing and they're sort of sitting down and, and, and watching screens almost for whether it's some sort of experiment or whether it's some sort of medical thing you know um, it's a really kind of interesting setup they've got there and I, I'm always trying to sort of figure out exactly what's going on there and what these TV screens are sort of doing doing to these people you know well so i think that's a a bit of uh the closest thing to satire maybe in the film yeah and that instead of having a place where um the homeless people would go and get food or a bed there's a place where homeless people can go and watch tv because it's become so important and actually uh one of the many things that sort of feels a little bit um like the like the film's predicting the future is i think um obviously not if people are homeless, but there's some levels of poverty that people experience where we would still expect them to have an access to seeing a screen. Like I remember like, um, so internet cafes 10 years ago before people had such good broadband and stuff were Mm -hmm. full of all different kinds of people. Often you'd go in, there'd be some like homeless guys, often be people looking, watching porn where you're just trying to like print something out for a job. (laughs) And actually (laughs) that was pretty much uh, what you're describing in the film is the cathode ray mission. It's like a charitable enterprise to give people telly so they can patch back into the human mixing board. And I always think like an internet cafe is exactly that. It's open to everybody. It's not expensive. And people that don't have these facilities at home can patch into the human mixing board whether that just means they're watching porn or whatever um, so true and it's so true you actually see people watching porn in that scene as well <laughs> yeah. on the tv don't you and it's in a and church it's yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing yeah absolutely amazing um let's talk a little bit about then too I, I guess the first kind of true moment of sort of weirdness is that moment when he's he's watching the video drone tape he speaks to brian or brian oblivion speaks to him and then we get that shot of debbie harry and he kind of like goes into to the TV almost, that kind of really classic shot where the TV kind of almost becomes this pulsating body. Um, first of all, let me just ask you a little bit about those practical effects. It's Rick Baker, I believe, isn't it, I think, who did the practical effects for yeah. this one. Yeah, Rick Baker from American Werewolf in London. Exactly, who won an Oscar for his work by this point on American Werewolf in London. Um, he's a bit of a genius, really. What do you think of the practical effects in this film and how it holds up? I mean... I, I love I love all of them. Some of them are great, and some of them are look, now don't look so great. But there's something there's something about it's all it's all practical effects. Obviously, there's no computer effects. There's something about the kind of like plasticity. Like you feel like 
you can pick up the prop. And so even if it yes. doesn't look like a real hand, it looks like a real thing. And yes. also that thing you've never seen before. You know, at one point a gun sort of grows long, veiny wires into James oh. Woods' hand. And the effect itself doesn't look like it's really happening. But it looks like a really nuts, mad thing that you could pick up, you know, backstage and be like, oh, what the hell's that? And yes. I just think that's got a real appeal. That, that those things do hold a real appeal. And actually some of the effects are amazing. So the moment you're talking about James Woods is sort of beckoned towards the TV by um, Debbie Harry's character. And he starts sort of putting his head into the TV. And it's her lips on the TV. And his head sort of seems to go through. That's just like a piece of dental dam, which is really thin plastic with her face projected on it. So it's like the absolute mm. most base, you know, you could have done that, a version of that effect at the, at the, in the 19th, the turn of the 20th century. Yeah. But actually it looks amazing. And also from, a, from Cronenberg's point of view, this guy being so entranced by an image of, of sexual image that he sees that his head is swallowed by the TV. That's such a potent sex violence imagery. Like that's such a potent way of showing what he's what he's talking about. I just think it's amazing. Come to me now. Come to Nikki. It is. It's just perfect, isn't it? I think, again, there's a reason why some of these images from this film endure, because they they say so much, even just with that simple image of him almost making love with this pulsating yeah. television. It kind of tells you what you need to know, doesn't it, about the film in that one image? You know? Yeah, actually, some of it you could watch with the sound down and you'd still get the basic, you know, the basic area of the argument. Um, and so yeah. some of those effects don't work so well, but um, and are a little bit more sort of rudimentary. But yeah, I like them. And again, of course, some of them have dated a bit, but... I think even if they're dated, like you said, there's that tactileness, mm. there's that plasticity to them, where even if you don't, you, you're, you're convinced, you know, even if you know it's not real, you're still just so marvelled by the art, I think, of it, the the craft of it, which I just don't think you always get with CGI, do you? It's, you know, even though I'm sure just as many work hours go into CGI effects, somehow it's not quite as exciting as when you see these real effects from this time, you know? Yeah, I mean, we're relating these films back to our bodies, like we say, anxieties about our bodies and things that can go wrong. And so to, almost like they rec- practical effects are required, you know, you need to see that puke, you need to see those those veins or what have you because the cgi version may look better but it's clearly got no it's not in three dimensions and i think our brains can tell that and if we're meant to be grossed out by something it's got to be real yeah exactly that it's as simple as that isn't it and i think our brains do just know Mm. um the film then goes deeper and deeper into this strange kind of dream reality uh the more it goes on and i guess it's so ambiguous and we never quite know exactly what's really happening in this film and what isn't um you know i was talking to someone on the podcast a few weeks ago who said his theory is that there's that moment when max puts the helmet on in spectacular optical uh and we never see him take it off again it, we cut to another scene later on and there's this idea that what if everything until the end of the film is him with that helmet on you know or whatever I, but I, again we'll never know but do you how do you kind of see this film you know is it just s- simply really happening to max is it in max's head have you got any theories about what's happening in the sort of latter half of this film um i love your friend's theory and i wish i'd heard it when i was watching it back this time yeah um yeah it's really it's really interesting because of course after that moment that's when all of the weird stuff starts happening in terms of the you know his friend coming at him with the pulsating videotape and him hearing all the voices in his head of you know kill the other people and all of that kind of thing you know i mean the problem is is that we know reality is fracturing for max from really early on he slaps his secretary yes. the secretary was saying was nice and then yes. apolog- and she turns into debbie harry's character and then she turns back and then he apologizes and she says oh but you didn't hit me so we know and this is really early on that what we're seeing can't be trusted and unfortunately for this conversation uh, that splinters into so many different avenues of what might be happening what Mm. i think is happening i think that he is hallucinating often but that broadly Mm. what we're being what we're being shown in that latter half is really happening so i think he is hallucinating weird stuff um, but he is also being used as a pawn in a kind of espionage game between the makers of Videodrome and the. It's it's complicated. Uh, I, I so I think 
like 75 percent of what we're seeing is true just with a kind yeah. of lysergic edge to it so i trust that that's what happens i trust that he uh, uh commits suicide at the end and i trust that when harlan and barry convex uh, who run spectacular optical um try to explain to max what their plan is i trust that that is the actual plan that that is but the problem is it's after so many explanations that it's not necessarily the one you take home. Yeah, I know. Exactly, exactly. Um, and it's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, this is, again, where the sort of the idea of this these themes that I'm exploring, you know, of the mind and body really do, they are one and the same, right? Because in some ways, this is just as much a psychological film as it is a body horror in a way, isn't it? Because we're so much, we're so much aligned with this kind of unreliable narrator, I suppose, in a way. The th- the thing that the, the th- that really stands out about it for me is that it's what I'd call a reality bleed film, which is yeah. when you're sun- so good examples are things like Pi, um, mm-hmm. maybe maybe a little bit Nightmare on Elm Street, where you're with a character, and then all of a sudden you realise they've slipped somewhere else. Maybe it's a dream, maybe it's a hallucination. David Lynch obviously does the, a lot of these very yes. well, and so th- that's the psychological aspect for me is that you're with him as he slips into another sort of arena of thinking and you don't always mm-hmm. know where that is but the thing that gives the, that little thrill is is the way they they sort of seamlessly slip i think that's what i love about this film and yeah. so the body horror is like decoration but for me like the heart of it is is those i wouldn't call it psychological horror but it's it's yeah it's about being in his point of view when his reality slips and we don't realize that it slipped yeah Um, and of course i mean you mentioned at the beginning of the chat you know that david cronenberg you know for example isn't somebody who you talked about in your book do you consider any of these films from his early career or let's just stick with videodrome actually i mean do you consider videodrome a horror film uh no (laughs) (laughs) is that is that the end of end of my time on the podcast right that's that no 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 that's that i'll tell you why i'll tell you why because so for the book um i had to try and define very narrowly what I personally consider to be a horror movie. And for me, Mm. a horror movie is a film that is trying to scare you. So you can watch Casper, Casper the Little Ghost, Casper the Friendly Ghost, whatever the film's called, a film about a ghost. It's not a horror film. It's not trying to scare you. It's a comedy. It's a family film. You can watch another film about a ghost, say The Entity or something, and don't get those confused because (laughs) (laughs) that would be a bad day. And it's very clearly a horror film. It's very clearly trying to scare you. And so there's loads of these Actually, most some of the films I love most are in the grey areas. But I would say it's a more sci-fi. It's like a reality bleed sci-fi. It's all this stuff. Because at mm. no point is Cronenberg trying to scare you. He's trying to make you think. He's trying to make you kind of question what might be next for humankind. And uh, he's got these uh, arguments about screen violence that are playing out. And at no point is there like a jump moment or like a shock moment. Like it's almost like he's trying to do something more complicated than that. Mm, you're right. There's certainly no kind of jump scares or anything like that, are there? There, there is a there is a sense of, and I'm famously very liberal when it comes to calling things <laughs> horror films. I will call everything. I, I probably would call Casper a horror film, you know. Um, but uh, there is to me a sense of, unease about yeah. this film though and and again it depends how you define being scared or being um, horrified but there is a horrible sense of the uncanny for me okay. throughout this film in that i don't really trust what i'm seeing i don't really trust what max is seeing and what's really happening and that there is that slight element of the grotesque as well um it's certainly in there although you, you, of course it's not it's not your traditional horror i think cronenberg said that the film in his career that he considers the only kind of horror in the classic sense is actually the brood um and other than that he's gone kind of sci-fi or sort of elsewhere which is quite interesting you could probably make a case for the fly i guess um yeah it's probably true about the brood mm. the brood when so you said that you find mm. grotesque stuff quite affecting in a way that i've said that i don't mm. so does does that set mm-hmm. you off in a kind of horror film way when you're watching videodrome yeah do you know what the 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 moment uh, when he discovers his vagina stomach (laughs) not a phrase you use every day (laughs) um is i think a really uh disconcerting and creepy scene and it's a combination of that discovery but also the the music the lighting at that moment the brian oblivion his voice and his laughter at that moment when that's happening and i i do think that there is something that is both kind of grotesque and and uncanny at that particular moment um 
Yeah, and I, I, it's really difficult. Of course, it's it's nowhere near the same sort of scare as you'd get if you were watching a James Wan movie or something, of course. But there is something there for me as well that does make me feel a little bit ugh and a little bit on edge at the same time, you know? And it's a feeling that I love. <laughs> I mean, I would say the the uncanny is one of the the most important aspects of a horror movie and it's really hard to to point it out that's yeah. the whole thing it's it's the yeah. you know the, that's the point i the, suppose the, yeah the unfamiliar familiar you know the for, make the familiar that's made strange or the strange made familiar and lots in lots of different ways it can have things that you think are mechanical proving to be organic or things that you think to be dead to be proving alive you know etc it's when things blur categories i guess so video drama is amazing for that because at some point the the videotapes he's handed are just videotapes and some points they're like breathing and sort of sexy and other points they're like pulsating organs i mean so yeah if you're looking for the uncanny this is there's loads of it in this and actually as well howard shaw's score is starts off sort of like a synthy you know the sort of thing you'd imagine would score a 1983 sci-fi horror i think it feels like a church organ like it's quite sort of almost gothic that score nothing else about the film is gothic it's all very modern it's all whatever but that score is kind of it's really hard to pin down yeah actually. i think that's what it is i think it's the style it's the lighting and it's the score there's something about it that feels slightly more gothic is actually quite a good way to put it i think um some of the lighting is quite extreme almost expressionist yeah. this like flickering light coming out of tv screens in dark rooms because again you know what you know, talking about kind of like technology that's becoming throbbing and pulsating and all that stuff, you know, you get that, you get that in, um, only with Cronenberg do you get to use the word throbbing as much as this, uh, but we get this in, uh, in existence, right? But I wouldn't call, I wouldn't call existence a horror film, but I think the difference is that it, it doesn't look like it's shot and scored and lit like a horror film. Whereas for me, Videodrome is a little bit more. Um, but it's a, it's hard to explain in words why that is. But it's it's a mood for me that kind of comes across, particularly in the sort of latter half of Videodrome. It's interesting. It is interesting. And, you know, I had to narrow it down. I had to be really tough on this for writing this of book. But you have a more expansive format. So you can include stuff that's horror adjacent or what have you. Like at no point, I mean... I couldn't believe I was going to write a 150-page horror book and not include David Cronenberg. But then all of a sudden you've written it and he's, he doesn't fit in, you know? No, totally, um, totally. And and again, that's kind of what's brilliant about people like David Cronenberg and David Lynch is that you can't place them anywhere. And that in itself is what makes them really interesting, I think. Definitely. I mean, you, you mentioned James Wan and he's, um, he's really good at making modern, scary, slightly jump scary sort yeah. of like, you know, pop horror cinema. And I'm not like, I, I love those films actually. But then you, you compare that to a Cronenberg and no one would ever have the same conversations about these two kind of directors because one's doing something quite obvious really well and the other one is doing something that still no one else is doing you know like was it 40 years later 39 years later or something and so that's why we're still having this conversation about Videodrome from 1983 because it's still weird and it's still like it's got something really unusual about it and i think that in itself is an uneasy thing um not knowing as an audience member what you're yeah. watching or what yeah, genre yeah. you know i think that there's something i find quite you know i remember the first time i watched a clockwork orange and being so kind of really disturbed and baffled and obviously it does have loads of really disturbing imagery but also it's the way that that imagery is presented almost quite operatic and quite comedic and it has like big orchestral music and and comedy in it and stuff and it's absurd and I was like that in a way made it even harder to take and uh, it's the same with David Lynch where I'll be watching something like Mulholland Drive which I think might be some sort of you know crime drama or a love story and then it has that scene with the person behind the diner and you go what the hell you know and yeah there's there is something also quite disconcerting about just not knowing as an audience member what you're watching i think which again david cronenberg gets yeah definitely and those things really last because people can't put them in a box you can't really make it safe and so if you can ever yes. get david cronenberg and david lynch on your show to talk about their work like together oh my god how good would that oh be oh my god uh, how amazing would that be? <laughs> I mean, uh, but 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 also there is this other thing with those two, and particularly David Lynch, who basically hates talking about his own films and explaining them, doesn't he? But um, I love in a way that I love in a way 
talking to other people like yourself about how we interpret his their films more than hearing from them <laughs> what they are because i almost think they've made these films and they're now up to us those films you know to kind of unpick how we want to unpick them which i love they're almost i mean cronenberg and lynch are almost opposites so cronenberg's like rational scientific mind what if yes. this and lynch yes. is like dream world so if you read this yeah. great book called cronenberg on cronenberg by chris rodley and it's basically you know a book-long conversation with david cronenberg about what his early films mean and he tells you like a university lecturer point by point by yeah. point by point doesn't kill it because they're still sort of thorny and fascinating but like he he knows all the permutations and he's, yes. he's very capable of telling you those permutations yes it's such an interesting difference isn't it between the two directors and cronenberg has that much more kind of logical scientific approach i think and um but but i think maybe this is what i love so much about Videodrome is that it also has this dreamlike quality, which I love in films as well. You know, yeah, you can't trust exactly what you're seeing. He keeps on slipping in and out of different moments. Actually, I think some of my favourite moments are in that, perhaps in after the first ten minutes where we've sort of settled out into what we're watching, and you're with him, and like I said, he slaps his secretary, but he didn't. He wakes up in bed next to a dead body, but he hasn't. And so before things go like full freak out, there's just that sense of like. Because reality is, reality is quite normal. It's presented quite almost prosaically at this point. Yes. And yet you don't know at any point, once the first time this happens, you can't trust anything you're seeing after that. And there's something about that that's quite alluring, I think. Yes, so exciting and so alluring. And also can be for some people also frustrating, I think. You know, there is a, there is a, also a sense, not for me, but I know people that have been put off by this film because they're like, oh, I couldn't, you know, can't make sense of it. Oh, really? You know? Well, I think, I think it's just, it's the same with many films by filmmakers like this it's the same reason why a lot of people would hate lost highway or whatever it's just you know you 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 don't have that comfortable safe from a to b to c narrative i suppose you know i've been through it all myself you see your reality is already half video hallucination if you're not careful it will become total hallucination You'll have to learn to live in a very strange new world. I had a brain tumor. And I had visions. I believe the visions caused the tumor and not the reverse. I could feel the visions coalesce and become flesh. Uncontrollable flesh. But when they removed the tumor, it was called Videodrome. I was the... I... I... was Videodrome's first victim. Okay, at this point in the episode, we are going to head on over to our new regular segment, Wild About Horror. Let's hear what Freudian cinephile Mary Wilde thinks about David Cronenberg's Videodrome. Hey Mike, Mary Wilde here again. It's so awesome that you're covering David Cronenberg's sci-fi body horror Videodrome this week. I love the techno-surrealist aesthetics of this film, and we'll be referring to Sigmund Freud's so-called iceberg model of the mind to offer an interpretation of it. Max Wren is a TV station boss who specializes in sensationalist programming. He's always looking for the next provocative bit of content, gratuitous sex and violence in chaotic abundance, to give viewers an allegedly harmless outlet for their fantasies and frustrations. When he comes across Videodrome, a broadcast signal featuring torture and plotless murder, he believes it to be the future of television and makes unlicensed use of it. Max represents the capacity of the human psyche, the carrier or vehicle for id impulses, with the potential to convey material that might be considered controversial or dangerous. The function of the id is always to cross the threshold of awareness, emerging from the unconscious into the realm of perception. There's no moral assessment taking place at this level. It's simply a drive aiming at pure expression. 
Videodrome is a prophetic film because the internet fulfills the function of that futuristic broadcast signal. The internet is the wild west of id impulses, giving unregulated platform to unconscious data that in real life would be judged unpalatable. Max's lover Nikki Brand is host of the Emotional Rescue Radio Show. She's the representation of the mental health practitioner, the purported emotional expert making a living advising callers on their problems. The fact that pop psychologist Nikki is susceptible to and aroused by an episode of Videodrome confirms the power of the unconscious to overwhelm the boundaries of the ego. However much Nikki might have wanted to project a professional demeanor, underlying disruptive urges still managed to collapse the illusion of control by the conscious personality. She surrenders to desires that had been previously unarticulated. Freud once said that the ego is not master in his own house, and this pertains precisely to Nikki's dilemma, the allure of excess overturning the values of the Enlightenment. The ego is only the tip of the iceberg. There's more to the psyche than what we see on the surface. Eventually, it's not enough for Nikki merely to watch Videodrome content. She even goes as far as to audition for it, but never returns. Her disappearance denotes the demise of ego dominance. The facade of restraint vanishes to reveal something more complex and ambiguous. Pop culture analyst Brian Oblivion, a stand-in here for the communications guru Marshall McLuhan, says that Videodrome is a socio-political battleground in which a war is being fought for control of the minds of people. Sure enough, this battle is also waged within the human psyche, between the reality principle and the pleasure principle, the ego and the id. Layers of deception and mind control unfold as Max uncovers the signal's source and loses touch with reality in a series of increasingly bizarre hallucinations. This is experientially how the internal conflict can feel, very disillusioning and depersonalizing. The head of Spectacular Optical, Barry Convex, secretly works to expose Max to Videodrome and have him broadcast it as part of a conspiracy to give fatal brain tumors to low-life spectators fixated on extreme sex and violence. So here, Barry Convex functions in the role of the superego, an authority figure operating as a powerful punitive force, with the goal to annihilate the illicit whims of viewers, believing it best to ruthlessly eliminate socially frowned upon desires. Marshall McLuhan, who lectured at the University of Toronto, said, When you are on the telephone, on radio or TV, you do not have a physical body. You're just an image on the air, a discarnate being with a very different relation to the world around you. One of the big effects of the electronic age is that it deprives us of our private identity. We're merging with everyone, every other discarnate body at the speed of light, becoming a nobody. David Cronenberg is known to be interested in Freudian theory, and this is very evident in Videodrome. The film revolves around erotic and violent impulses being represented on the body, with Max's torso turning into a VCR orifice and his hand fusing with a phallic, deadly weapon. These transformations align with the Freudian perspective that human subjectivity is written on the body, that our physiology records our experience, particularly in relation to trauma. The paradox is that in an age of electronic telecommunications, and certainly now with the advent of social media, human identity is externalized. It's an alienated representation in the ether, seemingly detached from the body, merging with other disaffected avatars, leaving a hollow space unoccupied by a concrete identity. This ambivalent state of simultaneously being grounded yet divorced from the physical realm creates the perfect landscape for Cronenberg to innovate in the subgenre of body horror. See you next time. A big thank you there to the wonderful Mary Wilde. Love hearing her thoughts on these incredible movies. And if you want to hear more from Mary Wilde, you can follow her on Twitter at Psychstar to get details about various courses that she runs. And she also has her own brilliant podcast called The Projections Podcast, which she co-hosts with Sarah Cleaver. You can find that in all the regular places where you get your podcasts.
Before we get to the ending then, are there any other moments, any other highlight moments that really stand out in the film for you? Any other particular set pieces we haven't mentioned? I have mentioned most of the things that really stood out to me. There's one thing that actually is pretty cool is he goes to um, a trade show for spectacles by a company called mm-hmm. spectacular optical run by the evil yes. barry convex and it's far this <laughs> far too much to explain here but basically he's a baddie it's like a bad apprentice show yes <laughs> like a, <laughs> an apprentice task and halfway through he, he goes up and, and shoots barry convex and then convex falls to the floor and just explodes in weird tumors and oh. those the effects are amazing and also what on earth is happening I know, and again, tumors. Oh, yeah. like there's there's a, there's a lot of talking, recurring talk. You know, obviously, Brian Oblivion sort of says, you know, I got these visions. I believe that the tumor emerged from the visions, not the other way around. And again, it's something really interesting. We talked about with the brood this idea that trauma and psychological trauma and stuff that you usually wear on the inside suddenly you wear on the outside in Cronenberg films, and those sorts of psychological problems become physical you know tumors or whatever they might be or growths you know and uh it's really interesting it's a really interesting experiment i suppose that kind of like yeah what if you had this trauma or you had depression but it manifested as a giant lump on your neck or something and it's like yeah it's uh again something really interesting that he comes back to over and over again he's also spoken about he i don't think he sees the body as a biologist i think and so he said about you know diseases if you see the world from a diseases point of view it's the hero it's not a bad thing it's just it's just doing its job and so i think he would say that tumors and and things that we would say are wrong with the body aren't necessarily they're just growing in a new way like the literal the new flesh and so i think he'd take a kind of cold distant view of that and say like well the tumor sees it differently than you do um exactly (laughs) that's it that's it and that kind of loops us back to what we've been saying that there is that kind of cold ambivalence i suppose to a lot of what he does yeah um but yeah that that moment is absolutely incredible why on earth does that man burst into all those tumors it's <laughs> it's bo- it's bonkers but it looks brilliant um finally then the ending what do you make of the ending you know when when he kind of he pulls off that sort of assassination there's that whole sequence that i always kind of forget about when he goes off to that sort of boat or whatever it is and kind of sit it, it's almost like by that point he's become a kind of vagrant or a homeless person like the the ones we saw earlier Earlier, isn't he yeah i think i think that's i think that's what's happening i think he's out of options i think yeah. we don't know whether he's he's pulled off these murders or not but i think we have to presume that he has and mm-hmm. there is no there's no further for him to go as an as a human character but as in as in yeah. actually most chronic Chron- Chron- said that this ends pretty much the same way scanners ends pretty much the same way the fly ends pretty much the same way dead ringers ends in that humans have gone so far they kill themselves or are killed at the end. Um, mm-hmm. and, but there's the sense that there might be something after. So he keeps on saying, you know, the, the film's famous catchphrase is long live the new flesh. And there was ending shot, which weren't included, which showed uh, Max and uh, Bianca Oblivion and Nikki Brand in Videodrome, in some sort of celestial Videodrome, um, still alive with new organs uh, that's just one of many ending shot. And so in that sense, long live the new flesh would make some sense. And as it yes. is, it's still a mystery. So, I mean, I think he does some of this stuff. He's hallucinating. He's got this tumor from Videodrome. He kills himself. And what happens then is a kind of fascinating discussion point. Yeah. And even 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 the way that, that that final shooting, that final like sort of suicide happens, the way we see it first of all happen in the sort of TV, that amazing shot where the TV kind of explodes with organs, and then we see it happen <laughs> and then we see it happen again. Uh even that and the fact that we have to see it twice kind of on screen and then in quote unquote reality is just a really interesting, fascinating thing. And I guess it does suggests that in some ways it could go on and on and on you know there's actually that thing continues if the if you think back uh, max ran at the start is on a chat show and when it introduces debbie harry's character it doesn't show her as a character it shows her through the camera so without oh. even telling us it introduces uh you know quite a major character as the cameraman would see her or as they say the audience would see her not as the characters would see her so it's already asking us to think about screens and how we're taking things in and so obviously like you say the bit at the end where where that's happening sort of 10 times over tenfold um the, i think the film's 
always been asking us to question this. I just don't know what the answer is. <laughs> I love that idea of that kind of the box within a box within a box, the TV within a TV. In some ways, this film is brilliant to watch at home, isn't it? On a television set in your front room rather than on a cin. I mean, not that I would, I would still love to see this on a big screen. I never have. But I think it really, in some ways, adds something. I always find this with The Ring as well. There's something about watching it at home on your television screen that kind of adds that extra layer to what you're seeing in the film, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It's the same with lots of fan footage, you know, where you're, you're effectively yeah. watching a home movie. Um, yeah. Yeah, or, you know, the sort of uh, unfriended, the dead and kind of things where you're meant to be yep. watching them on a, on a computer screen. Actually, them not being a cinematic experience adds to them as a horror experience. I'm not sure about this with Videodrome because it, obviously at the point at which he made it, it would have been intended to be seen in the cinema. Of course. Um, videotapes were so new and stuff. But yeah, I, I would love to see it in the cinema also and haven't um, Yeah. one day. But And again, you know, even if it wasn't planned to be shown in that way, it's just ahead of its time in the way that, of course, it it has, you know, it that this is the only way we now all watch it. Um, and I really think that is like an interesting extra facet. Although you got to see it on a VHS, which must have added <laughs> that extra grain as well, because I love the idea of a bit of grain on this film, you know? Yeah, but we didn't think of it as grain then. We were just, I, was no. just, I was just glad <laughs> to have a copy of this film that you couldn't get anywhere. I didn't realise it had like seven minutes cut from it and it looked like shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. No one no one enjoyed that grain back then, did they? But now there's that, there's that kind of hipster thing now where we all go oh yeah remember VHS and the VHS grain you know <laughs> long live the new flesh do you think that this film does still hold up you know what is it nearly 40 years old now and, and would you still sort of recommend this film to, to newbies yes it's full of absolutely fascinating ideas that like you said that are still running on today about what we should and shouldn't watch and how it affects us um it's about the point that one of the greatest directors that have ever lived one of the great certainly one of the horror direct greatest you know horror adjacent directors that ever lived it was about the point that he got went from really interesting to absolutely amazing video drone yeah. the dead zone the fly dead ringers that is one of the yeah. best runs that any film director has ever had in history i would say and so if mm. you have any interest in those themes or in Cronenberg or in horror or sci-fi cinema or in exploitation cinema of that era, why would you miss this film? Yeah. It really, it really holds up, you know, despite the fact that in some ways it's so of its time, it's so early 80s in what it's tackling. It also is, like we've talked about, it's so universal and it holds up so well, I think. It's just this beautiful film uh, weird and beautiful and I think also has so much rewatch value I think because you can never completely make sense of it in your head and that's my favourite type of experience I think yeah I mean I'm going to watch it again with your friend's uh, theory in mind and see if yeah. I think it's correct but just not this week maybe I've got overloaded yeah. this week but <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly uh, amazing Matt thank you so much for, for this and for joining me uh, final couple of questions that I ask all my new guests first of all what's your favourite horror film I've been thinking pretty hard uh, about this one a lot at the moment because obviously writing the book of horror mm. and it's one of those things that changes every day. I've just collated all of the horror films that have ever scared me shitless <laughs> into a book <laughs> yeah. and now like I have to pick my favourite. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say Lake Mungo. Oh, for now. What a film. What a film. It's moving. It's scary. It's so scary. And it's so I know scary. people are starting to catch on partly through your podcast and that, but it's still underrated. I almost, almost got an interview with Joel Anderson for the book, um, oh. which, who's the director who's sort of not been heard of since. And I will regret the fact that I didn't to my dying day. But what a film. I absolutely love it. And there is something, you know, like you said, that director who hasn't really done anything since. There's something that about that that adds to its to its mythic kind of uh, reputation almost that it's slowly gaining yeah. this film you know I mean how much um, did, how much did that let's think how much that film costs and how much we would all chip in to Joel Anderson oh. to see his second film oh my god I'm good I'm good for like 25 pounds yeah at least <laughs> absolutely. Like, right absolutely right now right now right yeah. now yeah no it's so true I mean it is one of the it's one of my proudest achievements through making this podcast I think is that it's probably one of the films that I've gotten the most 
um, kind of emails about where people have gone, thanks to the podcast, I checked out Lake Mungo. And because not enough people have heard of it, not enough people have seen it, and it is so good. It's so underrated. Um, this might be the same answer then, but my other question for you was going to be, what is your scariest horror movie experience? So uh, this might be annoying to you, but I've got, there's two. For yeah, this. go for the, it. The, so the scariest, I think the scariest film ever is The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a very standard answer. I remember I saw it when it was re-released in 1999 and I saw it with my dad, bless him. And we, we, were, we were with a bunch of, just a bunch of students and us. I think I was a student too, but I was a film student. And they were all laughing all the way through it. Oh. And we were just absolutely ashen. And it yeah. got to the end. And I was thinking, what film did those other guys see? Because oh my God. I was terrified. Yeah. But I, I imagine you get that answer a lot. The film, the most, the scariest film experience I've ever had. I used to be a film critic in Hong Kong and we'd... Uh, review from discs and i had to review uh, the grudge due on the grudge when it came out oh my god and so i was handed a disc and i went home to my flat which was an eight was in hong kong so it was an asian style bland flat like the house in the grudge oh. and and you know when you watch something you know when there's an explanation of what's happening it gets less scary so there was no English subtitles on the Grudge, which is a really, it's a really hard to follow film. It's, right? it's, it's really jumps. it's really baffling anyway, even with the subtitles. Anyway, yeah. So what I was faced with, I was sitting in a flat that looked like the house in the movie. I was in Asia, which is you know the vague general setting yeah, of the film. Yeah. And I didn't have one absolute clue what was happening, and yet you know obviously the clicky kind oh. of comes, she demon comes downstairs, and so. There was no explanation. Nothing could tell me when the film was ended that things were going to be okay. And I've seen it since, and I've seen it like when you can understand what's happening, it's less scary. But that was hands down probably the most scared I've ever been in my life. Oh my God, it's so... Yeah, I, I talked <laughs> about that film with um, Rosie Fletcher. You know Rosie, of course, from Total Film, right? Yes, of course, yeah. Um, and it's so funny, me and Rosie trying to trying to between us make sense of really what that story is about and we're kind of going yeah and then it jumps back to the girlfriend of the friend of the but it doesn't really matter because it's just like set piece after set piece of horrific things happening to people in that house really isn't it like just scene after scene of you know in the words of rosie stuff that's not okay essentially <laughs> that's like, yeah. it's yeah it's, it's definitely all not okay but it's it's just like watching it's like it's like watching the video from the ring over and over and over again but with, <laughs> so with no context you're like yeah that's scary yeah that's scary yeah that's scary and, and i still don't know anything more by the end of it so yeah. yeah i feel like the moment you explain something to someone even just a bit of backstory or whatever they can go, okay, that's fine, I can sleep. If you never give them that backstory and you make a good film, they're going to be absolutely ruined. The, and the sad thing, I think, sometimes with some of these most iconic, scary films is that that they, they become so entrenched in pop culture knowledge that... I feel like a lot of people now will have seen the scene with the girl crawling down the stairs and maybe it has less power now than it might have when it first came out. I don't know. I might be wrong, but, you know, I, I do think that's a sad thing about a lot of classic horror is that we've all seen the shower scene in Psycho. We've all seen some of these individual set pieces that at the time was so terrifying, you know? Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the things that the Book of Horror is trying to do. I, I would say that Due on the Grudge is one of the scariest films ever made, mm. but is it one of the best films? Is it one of the best horror films ever made? I mean, almost on no level would it count for that, <laughs> <No>. except <laughs> except that it's absolutely terrifying. Yes, yes. And and that's such a weird disconnect that we you know we praise well made films, and you know lots of it is well made, but you know what I'm saying? It's not you know it's not it's not a, a genius work of art, and yet it is enduringly terrifying. And I think that's the sort of thing most of us horror fans we'd rather see that than something that was really well made but didn't. Yeah. And actually, Raise for, our pulses. for me, the the film that ticks all those boxes is you've mentioned it is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I, I I I do think it's the greatest horror film ever made, and it probably is one of the scariest ever made for me as well because it's it feels like that sort of video that you're watching in Videodrome. It feels like you're watching something dangerous, almost something snuff like. When actually the genius of it is that it there, there isn't anything right. It's like a, it's like the best magic trick you've ever seen in a way because there is no. Um, explicit violence or gore on screen or anything um, but you feel horrified when it's finished you know yeah it's got there's a certain um, oppressiveness and uh, unstoppableness about it but, mm. you know that first 20 minutes is pretty nondescript I mean it's kind of nicely shot or whatever yeah. and then from the the hammer Leatherface's oh. hammer coming down onwards 
it doesn't stop. Actually, it's so... I was watching... I've been watching these films for the book in my house and watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre back, like, had my wife in, like, many other rooms away, like, traumatised her because it's just screaming oh. for about 55 minutes yeah. of the worst screaming ever. So even if you've never heard of this movie and you just heard someone watching it, you'd still be in bits. Yes, that's it. It's the sound design. It's everything, isn't it? It's amazing. Uh, excellent choices. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for joining me. This has been so much fun. Um, so just remind us again, um, when is the book going to be coming out and what's it called? So it's called The Book of Horror, The Anatomy of Fear on Film. And with it's got beautiful illustrations by Barney Bodoano. And you can find it in all good bookshops and online from 22nd of September this year. Amazing. And where can people find more of you and your work and your writing and stuff like that out there on social media or the internet or whatever? You can find me uh, on Twitter at Matt Glasby. And you can find me at mattglasby.com. It's my website. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to my brilliant brand new guest, Matt Glasby. Such a pleasure to have Matt on the podcast. Matt, if you're listening, come back again and join us very soon. And if you're interested in Matt's book, I will list the details of how you can get hold of a copy in the show notes, but also keep an eye on our social media channels because we may very well have a few giveaway copies available very soon. So, what did you think of this week's episode? What do you think of David Cronenberg's Videodrome? Where does it rank for you in Cronenberg's filmography? Please do get in touch. The email address is evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Letterboxd. If you want to discuss this week's film and anything else horror-related with fellow listeners, then you can simply sign up to our discussion group. That's the Evolution of Horror discussion group, and that can be found on Facebook. Don't forget we also have a YouTube channel, EOH TV, in which we are bringing you regular video content that includes reviews, interviews, vlogs, and video essays. Please do get involved, youtube.com slash evolution of horror. You can find this podcast on all major podcast platforms, including iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, Acast, Libsyn, and Spotify. Please subscribe to us. Please do tell your friends and family about us. Spread the word about us if you can. And if you haven't done so already, we would hugely appreciate a little rating or review on Apple Podcasts, which helps us get discovered by new listeners. Okay, well, next week... Oh, God, this is just like Christmas for me. This really is. It's just all of my favourite films back to back but we are swinging from Cronenberg back to Lynch next week we are going to take a little look behind the white picket fences at the sordid horrors that reside behind closed doors next week I'm going to be joined by filmmaker Prano Bailey Bond to discuss her favourite film of all time and let's face it one of the legit greatest films ever made Next week, we are going to be discussing David Lynch's Blue Velvet. Join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror. Evolution.